deadly sins. And uh, there are a lot of sins that I'd rather talk about than the one we're going to talk about today, okay? So uh, we have talked about envy and greed and anger and sloth and gluttony, and I have been pretty forthcoming that these are things that I struggle with. Pride is going to be the last one because that's traditionally seen as the root of a lot of these. Um, wraps it kind of all together. That'll be the next thing we cover. Uh, but today we get to delve into lust, which I have procrastinated as long as I could in the hopes that the apocalypse would come and I would not have to get into it. Um, so we get to talk about sex in church. Everybody all right with that? If you're a parent here and you weren't aware of that, this may be a time to uh, go to faith. Uh, <laughs> Just for the morning, I mean. Um, now, I will put your mind at ease. This is not going to be a how-to talk. Uh, <laughs> I'm using no illustrations. There's not even a whiteboard up here, okay? A certain Monty Python scene comes to mind right now. But <laughs> Anyway, uh <laughs> April's in Adventureland. We're all safe. Uh, before... <laughs> Before we get started, uh, just a simple little survey. How many people here are adulterers? No, I, I, you don't have to raise your hand. I, I just, you know, I, but uh, you know, I just want you to think about that for a minute um, as I read our first scripture, which is Matthew five twenty-seven to twenty-eight, and this is Jesus talking, and he says, "This you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you." that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Okay, so shall I pose my question again? How many people here have committed adultery in Jesus' fashion? Again, we don't need a, raise of ha uh, a raising of hands. Now, I think it's a little unfair. This seems to be very weighted towards the masculine side of things, which I have to say, I think this sin... Uh, does maybe tend on, on the masculine side, that, that, that men tend to struggle with this maybe more than women, but certainly it is not only a sin for men. Um, as the b series Fifty Shades of Grey made, or was it a book? I, don't, I didn't read it. But uh, I think that made it abundantly clear that this is a topic for women as well. Um, and it's honestly, it's very hard to live in our society without being touched by this particular sin of lust almost every day, right? It surrounds us on every side through ads and books and pop culture and TV shows. Can you believe the stuff they're putting on TV shows lately? Like that would have been classified as pornography like just a few years ago. It's now just called Game of Thrones or whatever. Name your show. There's a lot of it going on. And... Uh, and so we live in this society where we're surrounded by sex every day. You can't even go through the checkout lane and escape this, right? Like, do you ever, does anybody ever get uncomfortable with your kids in the checkout lane? Like, hey, kids, look at these candy bars. Don't look over there. Um, I remember there were certain stores, I think, down in the States that covered up certain magazines because they were family-friendly or whatever. But uh, we're in a culture where we've tended to move away from God, right? And there tends to be less emphasis on God, God. But it almost seems like sex is moving in to take his place. And so sex becomes our object of worship, the way we get our identity, the way we get our comfort, the thing that validates us. And then lust becomes our means of worship, our means of expressing our adoration to this new God of sexuality. And it's really interesting to me how our, our culture looks at Christian values, traditional values, and says those are old-fashioned. It says basically the church, the Bible, Christians make too much of a big deal out of sex because it's, it's just sex. He talks about casual sex, says, hey, hey, this is really not such a big deal, and yet our culture still treats it like it's the highest good. It's either no big deal or it's the highest good, but it really can't be both. And our culture kind of tries to send 
both messages and says, hey, Christians, you make too big of a deal out of it. It's not a big deal. And it's also funny to me how in the midst of a, of a culture that's very much into sex, uh, but, but doesn't really seem to think that it's that big a deal, it still seems that all of our love songs are all about, well, please hold me forever. Hold me forever. I want to be with you forever. Why is there such an ideal of that if really one night stands are just as good? And, and so I think our culture is sending us a lot of mixed signals. I think our culture is a bit confused on whether sex is the highest good in life or whether it's just something physical that you do that feels good. Um, and so I want to talk about that today. I want to talk about sexuality and the Bible's view of sexuality before we think about lust. And I want to admit that in our culture today, talking about lust, talking about sexuality is a bit like a fish thinking about water because sexuality and lustful attitudes kind of surround us all the time. And so it's hard for us to get a good grasp of it. I think in this area, we're maybe a little, a little bit calloused, a little bit um, uh, overly used to it that we don't really, like nothing kind of shocks us anymore. Um, so on the other hand, some people think that the Bible has a very prudish and naive view of sex. Uh, th- I think people tend to think that the sexual revolution of the 1960s kind of invented sexual freedom and promiscuity and that sort of stuff. And before that, we just had several millennia of the 1950s, right? Did you ever get that, uh, that sense that, that sex is like a modern invention? Uh, we've just figured this out recently. Um, bef- <laughs> before now, they only used it for procreation. No, of course not. Sex has been around, and it's been something that human beings have struggled with, enjoyed. It's been good. It's been bad for thousands of years. And so the Old Testament is very honest about sex, okay? David, one of the big heroes of the Bible, his great moment of shame is when he sees a woman who's taking a bath, sees her naked, gets caught up in that. I think we might talk about this story next week and ends up committing the greatest sins of his life, even committing murder, because it all begins with lust. And so the Bible is not like, oh, no, these things don't happen. Let's pretend everyone's perfect. Uh, Their son, Bathsheba, and David's son, Solomon, had a thousand partners, a thousand sexual partners at once. I don't mean like on the same night, but, you know, all at once. (laughs) He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. You don't have that many women in your life for companionship and conversation, okay? There was a reason that he had those, and that ended up being his downfall and what pulled him away from God. Not women, but uncontrolled sexuality. Okay, if you've ever read the laws about sex in the Old Testament, you realize that they have not invented much in the last 3,000 years. Okay, I'm not going to read them, but... You just read them and go, who would think of that anyway, right? (laughs) Like, why does there need to be a law about that? The Old Testament even has an entire book that is dedicated, called Song of Solomon or Song of Songs, that's dedicated to romantic love and reads like an erotic love poem. It's like the, uh, you know, the R-rated music of that day, although comparing breasts to deer fawns or gazelles or things like that. I've never quite understood, but back then I'm sure it made sense. And while the New Testament might not have that much of it, it certainly talks about sex quite a bit. Uh, The New Testament was written in the midst of a culture that was just as sex crazed as our culture today, okay? Just as loose with sexual morals today. I always love coming across passages. This is always fun in church when I read them, you know, and I'm trying to get make another point but I read in the midst of the passage that Paul tells them, stop going to orgies. Okay, you don't have to tell people to stop going to orgies unless they've been going to orgies. Okay, so (laughs) I I just want to make the point that that the New Testament was not written in the 1950s. It was not written in this golden age where nobody ever did anything wrong. In fact, one of the churches was uh, planted at Corinth. And Paul gets annoyed with them because they're having a hard time holding this part of their lives together. And he writes in one of his letters in 1 Corinthians, he says, I'm annoyed at you guys because 
you're tolerating a type of sexual sin that's even like kind of gross in society. There's a guy sleeping with his father's wife, and I hope that it's his stepmom. It doesn't really detail it. But Paul's like incensed because they're like proud of it. They're like, hey, we're, we're so accepting. That's fine. If you guys love each other, that's fine. And Paul's like, no, they're, yes, we're about grace. We're about love. We're about forgiveness. But, but, but no. And, uh, and so he says, hey, this is a time for accountability and discipline. But, but these are people in the church, not people outside the church. And around them in the city of Corinth, there was a temple uh, dedicated to the worship of the goddess Aphrodite. And part of the way that you worshipped at that temple was by going and having sex with a temple prostitute, which uh, I think would make church more popular with men. But I'm not sure about the moral, um, you know, <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, but this is the environment that Christianity thrives and grows in. The same environment that we have today. And so Christians who denounce the moral decay of society and and blah, 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 on and on. I don't think they realized that that was the same type of society that Christianity thrived in before. And and just because society is going downhill doesn't mean we have to follow. So first Thessalonians, we're going to talk about the, the Christian ethic around sex that that was very different than the ethic of their day that was built upon a Jewish ethic, but that carried over into Christianity. So first, first Thessalonians, as uh, Larry from Veggie Tales would say it, uh, four, three to eight starts to talk about this. Just going to hit a couple passages quickly. It says this. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God, and that in this matter no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. Just to be clear here, he's writing within the church, and if he feels the need to write these things, it's because they were struggling with them the same way that we do today. He goes on to say, and this is a little scary, the Lord will punish all those who commit such sins as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. So it sounds to me like Paul is really trying to say, listen, guys, I know I told you this before. I don't think you took me very seriously here. This isn't just my opinion. I'm not just, you know, being uptight. This is important to God that you live pure and holy lives. And so he says part of living a holy life is keeping yourself sexually pure. And one of the things he says here is avoid sexual immorality. That word was the word porneia, which is where we get our word pornography and it meant illicit sex sex outside of the boundaries of a lifelong committed relationship of marriage that god had created it for but it's interesting that he point he presents this as a learning process he says each of you should learn to control your bodies in a way that is holy and honorable it's a learning process and he recognized that they had grown up and they were part of a society that didn't value that and he's saying, now that you're Christian, you need to learn to act differently. And one of the ways is, is you have to take control of your body. Your body has certain desires. You can't just let them rage uncontrolled. You're called to live a different life. And so you need to learn to control that. And, and again, he says, this is not just my opinion. This really is important to God. It's God's will that you do this. So 1 Peter 4.3 also talks about it. 1 Peter 4.3-4 says, For you have spent enough time in the past, doing what the pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They, your friends around you, are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless, wild living, and they heap abuse on you. I don't know if anybody's ever had that experience where you try to change your life, you try to do something different, maybe you lived a certain way all before, and, and you're trying to make changes, and, and you just feel like God is putting it on your heart to live better, and the people around you don't like that. Because, first of all, it kind of convicts them about 
you know, what, are you too good for us? You know, and on the inside we're thinking, ooh, I probably should make those changes too, but I don't want to. And there's a lot of different dynamics, but this has been going on for 2,000 years. And Paul doesn't say avoid those people, get away from them. You know, in fact, in another passage, he's, he says that the Christian moral ethics surrounding sexuality is for Christians, and they shouldn't expect the world around them to live up to those standards. In fact, if you expected everyone to live up to your sexual standards, you'd have to get out of the world completely, which is not the point of Christianity. The point is to live within the world and to be a witness to the world. And so Peter here writes and says, hey, you know, people are going to think it's strange that you're not doing the same things that you used to do. But he says, you've, you've done enough of that. You've spent enough time living that way. Was it, was it really all that you thought it was going to be? We didn't invent partying, by the way, as you can tell from this voice or from this verse. We didn't invent partying in the last few years. People have turned to partying. What did he call it? Debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, um, and uh, detestable idolatry. They, those things were going on. That was a way of escaping the grind of everyday life. It was a way of just letting loose and having fun back then, the same way it is today. And he doesn't say... You're a terrible person if you did that. You're not a very good Christian if, if you do that. So he's, he says, ah, you've done that, right? Like it didn't, it, where did it get you? You've spent enough time doing that. You need to come out of that lifestyle now. So Paul doesn't assume that all people and Christians or all Christians in the churches are innocent, you know, squeaky clean, born and raised in the church, good people. He, he assumes that they had this background but that Jesus calls them to a new and different kind of lifestyle. Now, why on earth does the Bible make such a big deal about sex? Isn't it just a natural human impulse? Isn't it, you know, just an innocent way to have fun, to enjoy yourself? It's not really hurting anyone, right? It's just sex, especially with birth control now, right? So the, some of those consequences are gone. So why not just have fun? Like, is, the, is God always trying to squash our fun? Sometimes it seems like that's what he's trying to do. But it's really important to understand that when it comes to sex, there is absolutely nothing innately wrong with it. Okay? God created it. God imagined it. God came up with it. He designed it, how it works, how it feels. All of it is something that came from the mind of God. And so when you think, if you know, if you're of age and all that sort of stuff. If you think of the best sex that you've ever had, the best, se best sex that, that feels amazing at all levels, physically, mentally, emotionally, you're connecting with the person, it's amazingly pleasurable. God invented that. God made that up. God is not ashamed of that. God doesn't feel weird about that. It's God's idea. In fact, sex is supposed to mirror our relationship with God in the same way that eating food and drink mirrors our relationship with God. A couple weeks ago, we talked about gluttony and how eating food brings us both nourishment and satisfaction. And, and that's great on a physical level, but we're supposed to get that nourishment and satisfaction on a spiritual level from God. And so food is there, it's good, but it points us to a greater reality in that we feed on God spiritually, we get nourished by him, we get satisfied by him. Well, sex does the same thing, but points to something different. Sex is about intimacy, a connection, and the pleasure that comes from that. And I, I talked about this once before, and I had someone say, uh, that weirded me out too much. And I'm sorry if this weirds you out, but God did invent it, and I think that it's supposed to mirror in some way the connection and intimacy we're supposed to get with our Creator. Now, I talked about yesterday how that comes out in different ways in different personalities. So some will be very emotional, some more mental, but, but we're designed to have a connection to God, to somehow experience intimacy with God. And sex is supposed to mirror that. And, and I'm just making this up. In Ephesians 5, 31 to 32, Paul's talking to husbands. He's saying, love your wives as Christ loves the church. And he goes on about that for a minute. And then he, he quotes from Genesis, the passage that's read at weddings all the time and has been read at weddings for thousands of years. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Notice he doesn't say one spirit, one emotion, one person. He says one flesh, which I think he might be hinting at something. Um, 
Then he says this. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. There's a real parallel between the best of marriage when you're connecting both emotionally and spiritually, physically, when, when you feel connected to that other person, that is supposed to be a picture of the way that God longs to co connect to us. Um, the problem comes when we begin to look to sex to give us what God is really supposed to give us. It's the same with food. When we look to food as our God, as food as the thing that really satisfies and nourishes us instead of God, then it gets out of control. We become controlled by it. It moves from something that's positive and good in our lives to something that will actually make us sick and eventually kill us, right? I, I read one stat, and I don't, I'm, I'm a little suspicious about this stat, but it said that one in five deaths in the U.S. was related to obesity <coughs> right now. So food, which is designed to nourish and satisfy and make us healthy, can become something that takes away life, that makes us sick, and that kills us. And I think the same is true of sex. I think that sex is good and something given to us by God to make our lives better, something to give us pleasure. But when it gets out of control, when it becomes our God, when it becomes the highest good in our lives, and we look to it to satisfy us, to give us connection, to fill our souls, it ends up making us sick. Now, not physically, not usually anyway. Uh, at least that's not what I'm talking about because I think usually the consequences for this are emotional. They're spiritual. They're things that happen inside of us that nobody can see. Wounds that we carry around that are related to sexual things that we feel ashamed about. Things that we've done that eat away at our soul. And when we treat food the wrong way, becomes obvious to everyone else around us you know it, we, we begin to put on weight we you know people can see it but the things that sex does to our soul whether it's pornography or an affair or whether it was sex with someone you didn't even love you just experimented things that you feel ashamed of you hold them inside and i think they erode something inside of us Anything, I think, that cheapens the sacredness of sex is dangerous for our souls. Uh, a river is a good thing. Rivers can be used for fish and transportation and beauty and all that sort of stuff as long as they stay within their banks, right? But when they flood and they move out beyond the banks that they're meant to flow in, they can do incredible destruction. And I think that's true with sex, probably true with eating, too. There's a lot of parallels between those two. So there's damage. I think sex, sexual sin, sexual promiscuity does damage, and that's why God is uptight about it. He's not uptight about sex. He wants to protect us from the damage that it can do because it's one of the most powerful forces, one of the most amazing gifts that he's given us. And when it is used improperly, it can do damage to us. So... It doesn't somehow mean it's the worst sin, like Christians somehow tr treat it sometimes. I, I grew up in a, a very uh, evangelical church that was very concerned that nobody ever had sex be before marriage, which, which I can understand that concern. Uh, but they went so far that there was this huge amount of guilt and shame associated with it. Like, this was the really bad sin. If you just avoid this, then Thomas Aquinas actually says, hey, you know, th this whole lust sexual thing, it's a sin of weakness, not a sin of malice. So in some ways, it's actually us just struggling with our own weakness. It's not maybe as bad as some of the sins that do particular damage to other people or intentional damage to other people, although sometimes sex can be tied up in that. And so what I recognize here is that I mean, none of us in this room are squeaky clean, right? And so if you're hearing me talk and you're hearing a voice of condemnation or you're hearing a voice of uh, you're not good enough or you're a terrible person, that's not the voice of God. That's not what I'm trying to say. Uh, but this is an important area to consider. So I want to talk about one more passage in 1 Corinthians 6 because I think it gives us the heart of the matter, the, the New Testament view of sex and what it's all about. 1 Corinthians 6, starting in verse 12. Paul is, uh, is 
almost having a conversation with them, with himself. So he's kind of speaking rhetorically. So when he has these words in quotes, he's kind of saying, hey, you're saying this, but here's my response, okay? And then the, the final section quotes there is, is like a proverb of the day. So follow along with me there. They say, yeah, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say, food for the stomach, stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he, he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. So Paul's writing this to the church at Corinth, the one that was struggling with sexual sin. Obviously, uh, some of the men were going to see prostitutes because otherwise he wouldn't have to talk about that, right? Uh, maybe some of the women, I don't know. Um, Paul is not talking to a bunch of prudes who never do anything wrong. He's talking to people like us who struggle with this, who aren't squeaky clean and perfect. And he's making a pretty good argument for sexual purity. First of all, I think the first argument he makes is I'm not going to be mastered by anything. And one thing that I can say is that sexual addiction is real and it's way more common than what you think. It begins as an expression of freedom. Uh, you know, I'm just going to take a little peek at pornography out of curiosity. or I'm going to mess around a bit. I'm going to experiment. I'm going to hook up. I'll download the Tinder app, whatever. Um, and what begins as an expression of freedom soon becomes slavery. You can't get out of it. You can't stop. It's exciting, exhilarating. It's validating at first, but then it becomes a prison because you can't get out of it. You can't stop. You begin to need it, and it becomes an addiction. And even back then, Paul says, okay, yeah, everything, maybe, maybe you do have a right to do what you want. Maybe everything is permissible. This isn't beneficial, and, and it's, it's something that could enslave you. And the second thing he says, well, he addresses the idea that it's my body, I can do what I want with it. And in some ways, that's true. I, as a pastor, have no right to tell you what to do in this area, okay? I have no right to push myself into your bedroom and meddle and figure out what you're doing there and condemn you and judge you. Not at all. It is your body, and you do have the right to do with it what you want unless you've given it to Jesus, and in that point, it becomes his body um, and that's the argument Paul makes here. It's not just a physical shell. It's not just this meaningless piece of flesh. It's actually the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's where God lives, and it's something that Jesus died to save. Because the, the New Testament and Christianity teaches that our bodies are actually really important. In that day, Platon. Platonism, is that how you say it? Platonism was very popular. Uh, the Platonic view was that the body was evil, the spirit was good, and so you kind of had to let go of your body and say hello to your spirit. But the truth is that the New Testament saw body and spirit as be both being from God and belonging to God. You couldn't compartmentalize your life. Your body and your soul were one thing. They were you together. And so to say, well, it's just, it's just a body, food for the body, body for food. God's going to destroy them both. Nothing lasts. Have a good time while you can. Paul says, wait, wait, wait. That's not the Christian view of this life, of your body, of physical existence. There's actually something very sacred about life and something very sacred about your body. And you need to treat it that way. And you need to honor God with your body because you were bought at a price. You're not 
your own to do whatever you want with your body. That's the second argument. And the third argument was that it really is about what you unite yourself to. In this passage, he's saying, you know, don't you're united to Jesus. You're united to God. Then don't go unite yourself to a prostitute. But I think you can carry that out into hookups and affairs and sleeping around and pornography. What are you what are you uniting your spirit to if you actually belong to God? Christians should focus on seeking greater intimacy with God, not filling the intimacy bucket by more and more sex or better sex or whatever. So I want to go back to that first verse that we began with that Jesus uh, said, basically, okay, well, you think you're doing all right because you didn't commit adultery with someone, but uh, I'm going to tell you that even if you thought about it, even if you looked at a woman with lust in your eye, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart, so you may as well go all the way. No, no, that's not what he was saying. Yeah. Uh, Now, that's kind of funny. Like, that makes this area that's already really hard even harder, and Jesus has a way of doing that. Even though he said he came to bring a light yoke and an easy burden, sometimes I read stuff like that and I say, are you sure that's a light yoke and easy burden, Jesus? Why do we stop not just at sexual sin, but at lust? I think there's two reasons. First of all, when we get caught up in lust, which is this undue desire, it's not the same as physical attraction because that we can't really control, right? That's not a sin. Uh, Lust is giving in to that. And being led along with that. And we're going to talk more about that next week. But the reason we stop before we get there is because when we begin to give in lust, we begin to to fantasize about another person, to think about them as an object to satisfy us, whether it's someone at work, whether it's our own spouse, whether it's someone on the internet, whether it's someone in a movie, when we let our minds go there, we are making that person an object. We're making them something that satisfies us, something that's there to somehow make us feel good. And when the second commandment that Jesus, or the second greatest commandment that Jesus gave was to love each other, and we begin to look at each other as objects of fulfillment, even if it's just in our head, that keeps us and blocks us from loving that person as a brother and sister, as a person created in the image of God. And this is something that's really important to understand about pornography, because in our society today, uh, there's a, an idea that it's no no big deal, right? Like, it's just pornography. You're just looking. The girls are there because they volunteered to do it, right? And, and they're happy. They're making money, right? It's not really about them. It's about what happens in you. And when you look at them as an object for your fulfillment and you're making them less than a son or a daughter of God, and they're just an image on a page, there's something wrong about that. There's something evil that takes hold in our hearts that that begins to erode the love, the selfless love we're supposed to have for other people. There's something very misguided. But the second reason I think that Jesus says, hey, don't just avoid the act, but avoid the thought and the lust and the, the giving into it on the inside is that, that once that river of lust begins to flow and flood, it's pretty hard to sandbag it down. And the more you let lust take hold in your brain, in your heart, the more likely you are to do something to act out. And so... The battle begins not in the moment of action, but the battle begins in your mind long before that comes. Pornography, I think, is one of the most destructive forces in our society today. I think it ruins marriages. I think that it ruins actual sexual experience for young people today because they've taken so much of it in. By the time they get to a real person, they don't even know what to, what to expect or what it is. I think it does huge damage. It takes sex out of, si- out of the relational intimacy that it was meant to have and makes it an image on a computer, image on a page, makes it mechanical, makes it empty. And so I can't really say this loud enough or often enough. If you're using pornography, stop while you can. If you're addicted to it and you can't stop, find help. Talk to me. There's a, a great uh, website that helps people with this called triplexchurch.com. Uh, xxxchurch.com. Maybe don't do a search for it. Maybe just type it in. Um, uh, (laughs) It is a battle for a lot of people, and I guarantee you there's people sitting in this room right now that have that part of themselves that's ashamed. They feel terrible. They're caught in cycles. It's just statistically lots of us struggle with it, okay? And so if you struggle with it, don't do it alone. Get help. 
find people you can share that with. And if you want to talk to me, I'd be happy to be a safe place for you to do that. Um, maybe not this morning. Uh, I also recognize um, that as I talk about this, we all have histories and pasts and presents, and nobody in this room, including myself, is squeaky clean in this area. And if you think you are, then just keep reading Matthew 5 uh, about, uh, you know, looking at a woman with lust or a man with lust. Uh, I'm not trying to set this up as an ideal that all the good Christians meet. And if you didn't meet it, then you're a terrible Christian. You're not welcome here. Not at all. Uh, I think I, I want to remind you of the gospel. The gospel is this, that we are all sinners. We have all failed in multiple ways. We all fail every day in multiple ways. We all commit most of the sins. And as a pastor, I'm not any different. Okay, I don't get some sort of special card that says I don't sin anymore when I become a pastor. So I understand. We are all on the same page here. And the gospel is that Jesus died to take away all of our guilt and all of our shame, everything we've ever done wrong, whether it's something terrible and a big deal that you did a long time ago that's still floating around in your mind and you can't get rid of it. Jesus died to cleanse that and get rid of it and let you move forward. Whether it's something you did yesterday that you regret, Jesus died to cleanse that and forgive that so you can move forward. That's what this is all about. And so don't feel like this is a baggage we have to bear. Jesus washes this stuff away, and that's the point. He also can heal the wounds that come because of things we've done that have hurt us. If you've been abused, if you've made mistakes that f you feel terrible shame about and regret for, he can heal you. It might take some time. And I want to say this, too. There's probably some here who are currently enjoying sex outside of marriage. And you're not convinced by this that it's bad, and that's okay. I don't expect to convince you in one sermon, and I don't expect you to listen to me because I'm somehow the person that tells you what to do. That's my role, my, not my role as a pastor. I'm not sitting in judgment on you. You're welcome at our church. But I would challenge you to consider submitting this area of your life to Jesus and saying, Jesus, you want what's best for me, right? You want me to be happy, right? This area of my life, I kind of like what I'm doing right now, but I want to follow you in it. So what do you have to say to me? And let him speak. Open that door a crack. Let him into that area of your life. Even if you're not convinced yet, open your heart to say, maybe, maybe, maybe you could speak to me. Maybe you could become in charge of this. Next week, we're going to talk more about this and what is lust, really, and how does it differ from just natural desire. I also want to say maybe next week it's going to be hard to raise your hand and ask a question. If you want to ask me a question ahead of time, send me an email, um, and uh, I won't disclose your name or whatever. I can just address your questions or, you know, drop an anonymous note on my doorstep or something like that. Throw a brick through my window. Okay, don't do that. Uh, because I know this is kind of a heavy topic, I wanted a way to respond, and even though it's a little late, I'm going to invite the band up now to, uh, to finish with a song. And I'm just going to lead us in a prayer. So um, it's a weird topic, isn't it? We can all, let's all acknowledge that together. This has been kind of weird to talk about sex in church. And for some of us, it's been uncomfortable. For some of us, it's been, uh, you know, shameful, guilty. That's not what this is meant to be. Okay, uh, Jesus offers you his love and his forgiveness just as you are. Okay, He's not demanding you change before he loves you. And we celebrate that fact. But he's inviting you to a deeper level of purity and a deeper level of holiness. So would you stand with me and we're going to pray together and then we're going to sing a song of dedication. A song that, uh, that expresses giving our lives to Jesus. That expresses the way that he takes away our guilt, shame. Let's, let's pray. God, I thank you that you got me through that. Boy, um, now I can take a nap. <laughs> and God, I confess that, hey, I, I have struggles in this area. I'm not perfect. And so to stand up and to, to pretend like I am would be hypocritical. So I'm doing my best to follow you, to submit this area of my life to you. And I pray that that would be all of our prayers. And I pray, God, that in the midst of a society that's obsessed and, and almost worships sex, 
you would allow us as individuals and as a community to set a different example, to live an alternative lifestyle for you. Not to condemn those around us, not to make them feel bad, but to enjoy the gifts that you have to give us in the way that you've given them to us. God, I pray for our thinking this week, that you'd be present with us in that and for our conversations uh, as we go along in our conversation next week, that you would guide and direct us in this area. In Jesus' name.
Let's pray. God, I just uh, thank you for the message today. Um, uh, you definitely delivered on heavy and convicting and, and uh, giving us lots to think about. And um, we thank you for that, God. And uh, Lord, I just pray that uh, everyone would leave here safely and have a safe week. And uh, just amen. <laughs>